Welcome to the Health and Human Services Finance and Policy Committee for today, Thursday, February 13th, 2020. Thank you all for being back here this first week of session. Um, not all of our members are present, but I do want to start out with introductions. We've had some staff changes, and so um, Senator Klein, <laughs> we're going to start. Um, we're going to do some quick introductions, go around the table. Thanks. Senator Matthew Klein, Mendota Heights. Senator Mary Kiffmeyer, uh, eastern part of Sherburne and Wright County. Senator Melissa Wickland, and I represent Bloomington and Richfield. Good afternoon. I'm Senator Julie Rosen. I re represent District 23, half of Jackson, all of Martin County, all of Faribault County, all of Blue Earth County, except the town of Mankato, all of Watanwan County, all of Waseca County, except the town of Waseca, and a couple townships in Lesur. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Senator Scott Jensen and I represent Carver County for the most part. And when I started, I started with Ryan Johnson as my uh, intern and Bailey Strand as uh, my LA. And they are the now the key people on this committee and they are the only people that stand between me and Senator Benson. <laughs> Ryan, go ahead. Hello, and I'm Ryan Johnson, as Senator Jensen said, and I am the new committee legislative assistant for Senator Benson and this committee. Thank you. And I'm Bailey Strand. I am Senator Benson's committee administrator. Um, Michelle Benson, chair, represents Senate District 31, and we'll come back to you two at the end when we're done. Go ahead, Senator Marty. John Marty. Oh. I'm sorry, I forgot staff. All right, let's let staff go next. Um, Mr. Albrecht? I am Dennis Albrecht. I am the fiscal analyst for Health and Human Services. Katie Kavanagh with Senate Council for this committee. John Marty from Roseville. Hello, uh, Carla Nelson from Rochester, represent Olmstead County, Rochester, Chatfield, Dovriota, Stewartville, and 14 of the 18 townships. Hi, Melissa Franson, Senate District 49, Edina, Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka. Uh, Senator Rich uh, Dreheim from District 20. I represent most of the Sewer County, part of Scott, and part of Rice Counties. And Senator Eaton? Senator Chris Eaton, I have Senate District 40, Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park. Thank you all. As you can tell, I'm a little rusty. Um, our single order of business today is Senate File 3019. Senator Jensen, if you would go up to the presenter's table. Um, we did have a change in author. Senator Pratt did an incredibly heavy lift over the course of the last few months. Um, but Senator Jensen is a passionate and committed healthcare provider, physician to thousands of people with insulin dependent uh, diabetes. And so we thought he would be a good advocate for the people who are both in need and the system that needs to deliver and meet those needs. And with that, um, the order of business today will be Senator Jensen will give us a brief introduction. He does have an author's amendment and we will express, we will have that courtesy. Um, I do have a technical amendment that will facilitate completing the fiscal note. And on that note, we are a finance committee. We do not have a fiscal note today. And so this bill will make a series of committee stops. I believe commerce and judiciary will be the path. And then for the fiscal note, it will come back here because it is our responsibility to manage this budget area. We will hear from Stefan Gildemeister about the populations uh, who are dependent on insulin in Minnesota, and then uh, go to questions to Mr. Gildemeister. Senator Jensen will present the bill, questions from committee, and then public testimony. And with that, Senator Jensen, um, Senate file, uh, let's move Senate file 3019 to be before the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you for everyone who's attending the meeting today. Senate File 3019 is a, a bill for an act relating to health care and it establishes a patient insulin assistance program and it requires health plan companies to provide notice to enrollees with dependent child coverage. If I could, I'll just go quickly over the, uh, 
the bill. Section one is a dependent child notice so that when you're aging off of your, ins your insurance with your folks, uh, you would be notified. Uh, the second section is the actual insulin assistance program. Senator Jensen, could you just be attentive to your microphone? Because as you move your head, it's fading in and out. Thank you. Thank you. Section three. I don't want to go too deep into the weeds because we're going to have plenty of time later on doing that. Section three deals with uh, information provision regarding lowering cost prescription drugs. Section four addresses the pharmaceutical assistance programs. Section five is a public awareness campaign. Section six is appropriations. Madam Chair, I do have a, an author's amendment, the A8. And members, the A8 amendment should be in your packet. Um, even though it is an author's amendment, Senator Jensen is significant, I think, to the stakeholders and to the members of the committee. Could you just give us a very high level reason or what the purpose of the amendment is? Thank you, Madam Chair. From the beginning, uh, starting back a year ago, the, one of the critical breakdowns of this need is the letters ESP. We had to focus on eligibility, we had to focus on sust sustainable finances, and we had to focus on a pharmaceutical distribution network. The A8 addresses this. Senator Eric Pratt has done an amazing amount of work on this bill to get us to this point. And I think what we need to do here with the A8 is we need to move the actual distribution to the pharmacies who are equipped to receive product make certain that the packing slips match up with the product received, store it, label it, refrigerate it, keep it between two and four degrees centigrade, and then get it in the hands of the folks who need to inject it for life. So basically the A8 does exactly that. It moves it away from the physician's offices and it puts it in the pharmacies. Thank you. Okay, so Senator Jensen moves the A8 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Senator Jensen. The A8 amendment is adopted. And Senator Jensen, I believe we're moving to Mr. Gildemeister at this point. Or were you going to bring in the technical oh, amendment? You're right, Senator Jensen. Thank you for the reminder. Members, the A9 amendment, and council is distributing it. Um, Minsher has communicated with us there were some problems um, Implementing eligibility as the bill was written, we have taken their advice and it will facilitate the completion of a fiscal note on their part. And so um, on the advice of Minsher, we are moving the A9 amendment, modifying some of the eligibility provisions. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for moving the amendment. I would just want to point out that the technical language that Minsher provides us in regards to the A9 amendment is applicable for both this bill and also the bill that's moving through the House. Both bills are utilizing the Minsure program to provide eligibility support, and this language would be necessary for both bills. Members, questions? Senator Abler? Well, thank you. And just to the general theme of the amendment and the, the commentary by the author about how that we're actually, there's a kind of a converging of the House bill with the Senate bill, and I just couldn't be happier. So thank you, Senator Jensen. Anything further, members? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Jensen, um, the change, I know that's not the technical amendment, but um, I'm realizing we're on the technical. Why don't we act on that first, Madam Chair, okay. and then I'll follow up with my question. Thank you, members. Um, so if I could have someone move the A9 amendment. Senator Abler moves the A9 amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The A9 amendment is adopted. Thank you, Senator Jensen. And Senator Kiffmeyer, did you have a comment? Uh, no, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, Madam Chair, just a quick question. So when we move from doctors to pharmacies, and you've explained it to me, but I think it'd be very helpful for the folks here today, why moving from a uh, doctor's office to pharmacy? Just briefly, I think it'd be beneficial to have you put that on the record. 
Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. I want to keep my comments brief, but I mentioned already that physician offices in general are not equipped to take in product that has to be stored with some fairly specific considerations. In addition, over the last 20 years, physician offices have been pushed pretty hard to move away from sampling pharmaceutical manufacturer products because oftentimes we get in habits that cause us to prescribe more expensive medications when uh, appropriate, equal, generic medications are available. In addition, legislation has taken place where physicians, when they sample products out of their office, are held to the same standard as a pharmacist would be in dispensing it from their pharmacy. So labels have to be applied, inventories have to be maintained, explanations of side effects and contraindications have to be provided as well. And generally, physician offices are not equipped to do that. So today, I think we probably have less than 10% of physician offices providing a wide range of sampling. There might be some, like my own office, that still does a small amount. We do take insulin samples and inhaler samples just because they're so helpful for us to educate our patients in terms of how to use them, in terms of getting them accustomed to providing an injection into their own body, or if you will, inhaling the full measure of medicine that's available in the various um, meter dose inhalers that we utilize. So thank you for your question. Thank you, and we'll save the remainder of questions for um, after we have heard from Mr. Gildemeister. Welcome, Mr. Gildemeister. It's good to see you again, and please introduce yourself and proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Stefan Gildemeister. Uh, I direct the Health Economics Program in the, Department, in the Department of Health, and I'm the state health economist. And I'm incapable of starting the presentation, apparently, so my skills are limited. But somebody is helping. Mr. Gildemeister, I feel like we're having a little trouble picking you up on the microphone. Thank you. Come a little closer. Is that better? Thank you. Very good. Um, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, Senator Jensen, thank you for uh, asking me to, to share some, um, some information with you. Um, it is, there are three things that I'd like to do today. I'll give you a little bit technical context around what we know about people who are insulin de dependent in Minnesota. Um, secondly, I'll share with you some estimates that we've developed, uh, that we have had the opportunity to, to develop over the last year uh, on, a, on a number of proposals. Um, but I should say they are not aligned with, with Senator, Senator Jensen's bill, but we certainly plan on doing that in support of the work that Mincher is doing um, on their fiscal note. And then I think I'll close with some observations around challenges regarding affordability of prescription drugs, in particular people with insulin. And I'm told I have five minutes, so I will speak even faster than I've started to. Um, just some technical detail that, that, that is perhaps useful context. Um, there, there is no direct information on which to uh, understand how some of the el eligibility ca uh, categories in various bills play out uh, in Minnesota. So we, we have pieces in different data. So when we bring estimates to you, they rely on, on a range of data. They require projections so that you have updated information. Um, they are robust in the sense that when we look at them from different perspectives, they seem to align. But I want you to know these estimates have uncertainties associated with them, like probably most data that you see. So with that, what do we know about uh, diabetes in Minnesota? There are about uh, 340,000 Minnesotans who have type 1 and type 2 di diabetes. Um, most of them, of course, are adults, but about 3,000 children have been diagnosed with diabetes. In addition, uh, the literature suggests there are about 100,000 individuals uh, in, in addition to these uh, 340,000 or so who may have diabetes but who don't know that yet. Um, their symptoms might have not risen to the level where they've sought support or they have pre-diabetes or they've been uh, avoiding to identify um, the, the problems that ail them. About 80,000, 18,000 individuals each year get a new diagnosis um, for diabetes. Diabetics, of course, oftentimes um, uh, have other chronic diseases, hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease. That's something to keep in mind when you think about the cost sharing that they're exposed to. 
And then as we think about uh, emergency assistance programs, about a third of individuals with diabetes, according to the literature, um, are insulin dependent in the sense that they regularly require one or more um, insulin products per day to keep their insulin under control. So when we, when we weave together the different data um, to develop some estimates, uh, we find that about uh, the insulin-dependent Minnesotans are about three-way split between people with commercial insurance, people who have Medicare, and people who are in one of Minnesota's uh, public health care programs. Another 2,800 individuals um, are uh, expected to be uninsured. But, but sort of... Um, uh, the three-way split that, that I'm showing on this slide. Um, the next couple of slides, we'll try to break them out by income and by cost sharing to give you a, an, an appreciation both of where the bill goes and how many people that might cover, but also sort of what the population looks like. So um, the commercial population, about 70% um, of insulin-dependent Minnesotans have incomes up to 600% uh, of poverty. Almost 80% of people in Medicare have incomes up to 600% of poverty, and, and most of the uninsured really fall into this population. There are, and these are not, not very sharp estimates, but about 150 uh, uh, ins insulin-dependent uninsured might have incomes above that. Um, on the next slide, we're, gonna, we're, we're looking at uh, what we think we know about the extent to which individuals experience cost sharing, um, and 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 some might say high high levels of cost sharing. So there are different ways of looking at this. Deductibles is one mechanism. High deductible health, health plans is one mechanism. We also can look at the share uh, or the volume of spending per month or per year that individuals experience. Here we're just choosing one example to ask what percent of people with commercial coverage are in a high deductible health plan. Uh, and it's about half uh, of Minnesotans uh, who are insulin dependent. For the Medicare population, they don't have high deductibles, um, but there is this um, feature called uh, the coverage gap. It's changed much over time. I don't want to bore you with the details, but about um, uh, three quarters of Medicare individuals are in this space where they, where their cost sharing is, is, uh, is, is somewhat high. Public program and individuals, of course, experience relatively little cost sharing, and that's reflected in the third set of bars. And then most of the uninsured, um, seeing that they have no um, no subsidy or no support, they pay out of pocket, and that's reflected in all of them um, experiencing high cost share. We've broken this out further by just focusing on the individuals um, who, in each of the categories, either have a high deductible health plan or uh, another form of high, high cost sharing, and the distribution by income is as you've seen it before. So I, I, I'll not spend more time on it unless you have questions later on. Um, so why does all of this matter? And, and I think you know this, um, So, and you've seen some of these data in the past. So I'll spend just a moment uh, here uh, to say the high cost of healthcare in general affects affordability of healthcare services for all Minnesotans. Uh, it's particularly uh, difficult and troubling for individuals who have chronic disease. So if we look at, uh, if we ask individuals, do you, have you had problems paying bills because of the high cost of health care in the previous year? And here we're looking at 2017, which is the latest data that we have available. About 7% of Minnesotans say, yes, I've had that, uh, I've had challenges. And 11% uh, of people with chronic disease say that. Um, it differs by uh, by income. It differs um, by the payer type. If it it differs by age, uh, and it differs also by the extent to which individuals have high deductible cost sharing, uh, and it differs in predictable kind of ways. So I won't say much more about that. Um, we we also then ask individuals in in the survey, um, has there been a time when you could not fill a or where you chose not to fill a prescription drug, uh, uh, a prescription that you thought was necessary, um, and and as you see a similar peach picture, where certain individuals say yes that has happened, uh, nine percent for the general population, 
uh, I think the number is about 16% for individuals with chronic disease. And then there are certain groups who have um, dis uh, 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 disproportionately higher rates. Um, it's the young adults, individuals who are aging off their parents' coverage, and I know this is a population that you are concerned about here. It's certainly the uninsured because of the limited cost sharing support that they have, and it's also individuals um, with, with high, high cost sharing on the right-hand side. Um, I will close with one remaining observation. So there are different forms of uh, experiencing challenges related to um, the cost of healthcare or high cost sharing or just uh, somebody's personal economic circumstances, N not being able to pay your healthcare bills, not being able to pay your other bills, foregoing prescription drugs, those are three components. But when we think about individuals who are insulin dependent, there's sort of another component of it that is incredibly tough. Um, and, and that is where individuals choose to ration the, the, the scripts that they have to make it extend farther. And, and I think this is important certainly for understanding the challenge that diabetics experience because of cost, but also for consideration ultimately about the design of the bill and about take-up questions. The challenge is there are a really wide range of data points on it, and I'll leave you with this um, difficult set of facts without necessarily resolving this for you, so I'm sorry about that. But essentially, um, when we ask endocrinologists, some will say, look, uh, virtually every one of my patient uh, in a given year, um, whether they have employer coverage, whether they have um, public program coverage, they have rationed their care. They might say on the weekend, I don't have much, I, I don't have plans, I'll just lower my, my blood sugar, my, my, my insulin, uh, and I will deal with the consequences. I'll just stay in. So these are some of the stories that we are told. Um, there are national surveys from a single side of study where, where they say 45% of insulin dependent uh, individuals have said, I think it's on the East Coast, have said, um, yes, we've rationed our care. And then, and then there's a national, national survey um, that is less, um, a national survey that, that, that um, took a different set of methodologies where 13% of respondents said, yes, we've, we ration our insulin. Um, you know, Dr. Jensen, uh, Senator Dr. Jensen can speak more to this, but rationing care is just not about feeling bad. It sort of has, for the time, it has long-term health consequences, and that's why, why that's important. And with that, I've reached the end of my, my comments. Any questions from members? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, Mr. Gildemeister, uh, thank you for your presentation and information. Um, one of the things uh, on your statistics, do you keep track of type 1 and type 2? I noticed you included them together in numbers, and there are significant differences between those two. Do you track those two um, on how many of each or what percent? Mr. Gildemeister. Madam Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, um, for this analysis, we haven't separated them, um, but, but you know, from diagnosis information that can be done, um, I think there's also a, a ton of national data that is probably representative of Minnesota, and, and we can share that with you if you're interested. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just... Senator Kiffmeyer. Because insulin dependent often or almost always goes with type 1, versus that and so and our focus here today is larger that that's why I'm asking so and, and a percent or something like that and one of the things um, patients not taking their meds as prescribed I know you're dealing specifically with insulin but that's a problem in other areas of care as as well is that correct Mr. Gildemeister Madam Chair Senator Kiffmeyer to, to your first point yes uh, so sort of Obviously, you're right on type 1 diabetes. I, I tread lightly on the clinical questions because that's where my expertise is really uh, very limited. But, but I think that's what you see when you're looking at the first slide, at the proportion of diabetics who are insulin dependent. That is primarily a function of the, the type uh, of, of diabetes that individuals have. Um, to your second point, yes, it's my understanding that there are ranges of, that, that patients, um, 
uh, will not fill a script for a variety of reasons. Uh, cost is one factor that we measure, but, but there is a host of reasons related to literacy, related to personal preferences, related to uh, probably other factors as well. Side effects too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Jensen, you had a question or a point. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer, for your question. If I could just jump in on that one. It might help just to have a few basic uh, factoids stuck in your head. First off, non-diabetics generally need one unit of insulin per hour to live. So you and I make 24 units a day if we basically don't have diabetes, sometimes 1.5. The other thing is about 90% of diabetics are type 2 and uh, maybe even more, and then 10% are type 1. Furthermore, approximately 10% of the population has diabetes. So in Minnesota, you can basically say 5.5 million people, we've got 550,000 diabetics. When you look at that number, you can generally multiply that by 10 to 20%, and that's who's going to be taking insulin. And there is a little bit of a misconception in regards to type 1 and type 2. In the old days when I went to med school, basically we were taught that type 1 diabetics used insulin and type 2 diabetics did not. But today we know that type 2 diabetics use insulin a lot. And many type 2 diabetics are at risk, not necessarily for going into diabetic ketoacidosis, but they'll go into something that's very similar called non-ketotic hyperosmolar uh, hyperglycemia, and that can be uh, lethal as well. Uh, I would welcome uh, Senator Klein weighing in on a couple of my basic comments about this. But I really think that we need to get past the idea of only type 1 diabetics use insulin. It is type 2 as well, and that's a big part of the problem. And then one last comment, if I could, why people ration their insulin. If they're on 40 units in the morning and 30 units at night, and they come and see me and their sugars have been running a little low, I might well say, well, let's cut that down by 4 units in the morning and 4 units at night. And so they do that, and they do fine. And after a period of time, they start to make some of those adjustments themselves. And when each unit of insulin costs 35 cents, if you can cut four to six units of insulin down a day, you're talking a buck and a half, two bucks. You do that times 365 days, you've saved almost $1,000. And then that's substantial. So it's, it's a very natural process. And then one more thing. Physicians have, we have created part of this problem because we prescribe so many prescription drugs. 5% of the population resides in the United States, but we use more than 50% of the prescription drugs in the, in the world. So we've taught our patients that a lot of the drugs that we give you may well be superfluous. Thank you, Senator Jensen. Um, Mr. Gildemeister, I do have a question on your page 7 slide. Um, under commercial payer, the high deductible health plan, does that refer to a high deductible specifically for insulin, or is that just a general policy structure? Uh, ma Madam Chair, for, for this definition, we use the IRS definition of a high deductible health plan. So it is a, a um, it's a insurance policy that comes with a deductible of, I think, um, Fifteen, seventeen hundred dollars at this point, but I can also clarify that I might be ahead of my time or behind. But but it is it is it covers all cost sharing, so it's not just specific to prescription drugs. Mr. Gildermeister, any other questions for Mr. Gildermeister? Thank you um, for being here. Um, we appreciate it. We'll have you back for something, I'm sure, this session. Thank you very much, Senator Jensen. I look forward to it. Um, are you ready for committee questions? Or do you would further comments to your bill? I have no further comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. To the committee for questions. Senator Wicklin. Um, Senator Benson, are you planning to have just general questions now and then some testimony? Or I guess maybe you can just tell me what you're... Um, I was going to let the committee ask Senator Jensen questions because this bill is new in front of us and then we can have public testimony and as always if members have questions related to public testimony um, we'll do that at that time. So no specific questions to the language? I don't have questions to the language. I, I have... Um, some amendments I'd like to talk about, but I don't know if you want to do that now. Or do if you, you have amendments, them? I think this would be an appropriate time, and that way the public can see part of this conversation and make their comments based on the bill as amended. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I guess, uh, Madam Chair, if I could offer the um, uh, 
the A2 amendment. And that I don't think has been distributed. I think um, Senate Council will distribute that. And Senator Wicklin, if you could begin a brief description of the A2 as the pages sure. are distributing. Sure. Uh, you know, we've uh, had a lot of discussion in the working group about um, how uh, people will come to the emergency program and what their ability will be to um, to make some kind of contribution to that emergency um, supply. And what the A2 amendment would do uh, would be to change the, the dollar amount that uh, a patient would be responsible for if they came to a pharmacy and they, they needed an emergency supply. Um, currently, the bill states that, that that responsibility of the patient would be $75. And uh, we really think that that would be um, too high. That would be a barrier that uh, many patients wouldn't be able to afford if they're coming in at the point of needing an emergency um, supply. So this amendment would change that to be $30, which is aligned with what the, the House and um, Senate other um, bill, House file 3100, and um, I don't know the number of the Senate file, but um, that was introduced today. Um, we just feel that if people are coming in and they're at a point where they meet the other criteria for eligibility, um, that the copay cost shouldn't be uh, an extreme barrier, and, and $75 seems like it would be at that. Okay, uh, Senator Wicklin moves the A2 amendment discussion members, and to, I'm sorry, to the author and then discussion. Senator Jensen, to the A2. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Wickland. Whether we land at 75 or $30, I, I can understand perspectives from both. I think that we need to be careful to not forget that many people in the commercial market pay $25 to $50 for their medications, and this bill is really targeted, if you will, to folks that are between 200 and 400 percent of their federal poverty guideline. And just to review, that's basically for a family of four, that's $100,000 is the 400 percent and $50,000 would be the 200. So we're basically looking at people between 50 and $100,000 of income for a family of four. If you're between zero and 200 percent, you would be able to qualify quite readily for MA or MinCare. So I, uh, I understand the rationale for lowering it from 75 to 30. I'm not certain what the right number is, but I would oppose the amendment knowing that this bill is going to be moving from one committee to another, and there will be an opportunity for further discussion down the road. Questions, um, Senator Wicklin, to Senator Jensen's comments. Well, I think, you know, we can, we, I, I hope that the bill continues to move along and does undergo other changes as it moves along. I mean, I, I appreciate that you've expressed that that will happen. Um, I do think that since we know that um, some of the commercial plans have come up with $25 as being a reasonable copay, that um, the people coming in for uh, a chance to get an um, a 30-day supply um, on an emergency basis, it seems um, like it should be similar to that. That would be a, um, an appropriate amount. So I guess that's why I would, I would certainly hope that we continue to have discussion about it. And it seems to me that $30 is reasonable. Senator Klein. Madam Chair, and question for the author. Uh, Senator Jensen, you're better at math than I am. And you quoted the income numbers for a family of four. Um, do you, would you be able to uh, give me a hazard at what the income levels are for a single individual for uh, those ranges of federal poverty level? Yes, uh, the Senator federal Jensen. poverty level for a single, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, Madam Chair. Senator Jensen. Yeah, the federal poverty guideline for an individual is $12,000 at 100%. So for an individual, 400% would be 48,000. So it would be 200 to 400% would be 24 to 48,000 and they would qualify for an APTC. 
Senator Klein. <clears throat> Madam Chair, so and, and if you look at sort of the signal case, the Alec Jones case that uh, brought this, uh, uh, sorry, Alex, Alex Smith. Smith, apologize, Smith, that brought this forward, you know, it's uh, young single individuals who don't have a family who may be working in an entry level job or waiting tables or so forth. Uh, and uh, for a person like that earning $24,000 a year and coming to the pharmacy and having a copay of $75, I think, could end up being prohibitive. So I would support the amendment. Madam Chair, to that point. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Senator Klein. And you're correct. Uh, in the, uh, if you will, galvanizing situation with uh, Alex Smith, I believe his income was somewhere between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars, and I think he was confronting the reality of a thirteen hundred dollar payment for one month. If we use seventy-five dollars, we would be paying nine hundred dollars for the entire year. So I can see where there would be a reason for further discussion down the road. Members, further questions? Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And I just want to thank uh, all this good discussion. And I'm so happy to see the bill beginning to move like this. And a lot of us have been concerned in so many ways. I think everybody at this committee wants to make sure that no one ever died in Minnesota from a lack of insulin ever again. I think we just summarized the view of the room. Um, and so, Senator Wicklin, I, you know, I'm supportive of finding a resolution. I signed on to your bill in a, as a way of support. Um, I just uh, the rationale of the copay, um, I'm not sure that 30 is the right number. I'm not sure. I think 75 is not the right number, and I don't know what number we come to. But I think, though, as we've been talking about this, if the copay is $25 at a health plan, you want people to be sure they go to that one. You know, if they're and not be drawn just into this program unnecessarily. So, um, for today, I, I wouldn't support 30, but I intend to work with you to find a good number that's not 75. Senator Franzen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Jensen. Thank you for bringing forward this important bill. Uh, I do support the Wicklin Amendment. I'm looking through all the packet of, of, of letters of support for the bill and perspective on what private pay manufacturers are allowing for uh, co-pays and um, I came across the letter from Lily and on the second page on the top says Lily Cares, a separate nonprofit organization is an option currently available that will provide insulin at no cost to people making 400% of the federal poverty level or less. About $5,000 for a single person and $103 for a family of four. So my question, Senator Jensen, if it's good enough for uh, the manufacturer, in this case, Lily, I'm not talking for all others, but in this case, um, from the handouts that we have here, why can't that be a good standard for us to explore right now with this amendment? Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, Senator Franzen. I think your point is well, well made, and I think we are discussing it right now. I think this bill has a, a journey to travel and at this point in time, I don't know that 30 is the right number versus 40, 50, 60, or 70. So at this point in time, I would prefer to not have that changed. Senator Nelson. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I, I just want to state how glad I am, and I'm sure all Minnesotans are, that we're seeing the bill that we're seeing today. And uh, the improvements that have been made, I think, will be um, life-saving uh, improvements. And so um, to the A2 amendment, um, at this stage, I, we, this bill will make other stops and other travels along <coughs> the way. Um, I, I don't... Uh, I don't know either if this is the exact right amount either. It might be premature to, to make an intelligent decision about that right now tonight. But I do want uh, to commend you and those, uh, Senator Pratt, Senator Brunson, who have worked on this through this time to get us to this point where I think we do have this nice convergence of both the Senate proposal and the House proposal uh, so that we can actually get this enacted. So um, while this uh, amendment here I think is premature, I think, uh, I think it's in the right vein to try and determine this amount, but I, I just don't quite have the information at this point to, to move forward with that. Senator Jensen. 
I won't repeat myself other than to say, Madam Chair, that I do look forward to hearing some stakeholder input into this specific question as well, and that will be helpful for me. Thank you. And Senator Jensen, Colorado did set the number at 100. Thank you, and Madam so Chair. As so we, as we consider policy in other states, um, that might be an important piece of information. Senator Wicklin, to your um, amendment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think given the kind of the time and um, that we have some other things to discuss, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that Senator Jensen is willing and open to discussing what the right um, number is for that. Um, I hope that we can continue to have that discussion as the bill moves forward and I'll, I'll withdraw this amendment. Senator Wicklin withdraws the A2 amendment. Thank you, Senator Wicklin. Senator Wicklin, do you have further amendments? I do. Um, I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Wicklin will offer the A4 amendment. Senator Wicklin, would you start a description sure. as we're handing out? So I think, you know, we're, we're um, I'm very happy that we're here today discussing this bill right away in session and having a chance to have a good um, airing of all of our concerns and um, support for the various aspects of the bill. Um, I, I think, you know, we're, we're disappointed that we didn't get it done last year or, or in a special session, but, um, you know, we really want to see something happen. I'm very committed to that. Um, and one of the big differences that we, we have between um, this bill and the bill that I introduced today um, is it, looking at how the emergency insulin is provided, um, how it's paid for. And so I wanted to um, be able to discuss, you know, changing the model um, in this bill towards uh, something more similar to the, the other bill and having an insulin um, registration and licensing fee which would be collected from manufacturers in order to cover the costs of the emergency insulin. Um, I think that the current bill requires that that funding come from um, state appropriations. And I think that from my perspective, that isn't the direction that we wanna go to um, acknowledge that, that the, the cost of the insulin, the prices of insulin um, are such a huge barrier for um, patients in Minnesota and we, we want to be doing something to address that. Um, by the state taking care of that cost, I think we're just um, saying that, okay, we'll, we'll manage, we'll, we'll help people, but um, we aren't really going to ask the manufacturers to be contributors to solving solving these emergency problems. Um, so the amendment adds the language to create an insulin assistance account, um, a registration fee, um, which would be collected and that would be used to pay for the, the emergency um, insulin supply. Um, so I, I hope that we can have a little discussion about that today and um, get that on the table because I think it's, it's really important um, to many of us to see that, that these costs are shared. Um, it's not saying that the state doesn't have any role to play in, in, in funding these programs, but um, I think the manufacturers need to play a role in, in funding the emergency insulin supply. Thank you, Senator Wicklin. Senator Jensen to the A4. Madam Chair, if this isn't too irregular, uh, I would just as soon reserve some of my comments and allow the committee to go ahead and discuss this, and I'll be glad to weigh in afterwards, but I don't want to dominate the talking. I have a habit Senator of doing Jensen that. Senator Jensen is a new day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess looking over this amendment, uh, Senator Wicklin, um, I, I don't see a, a fee amount. Can you kind of go over what the projected uh, registration fee would be? Senator Wickland. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Draham, the since we haven't um, come up with a total fiscal review of what the operational implementation cost is and the um, number of Minnesotans, I think, um, uh, Stephen, Stefan Gildemeister gave a good overview of 
the populations that we're hoping to address with this program and the eligibility guidelines. Um, and certainly the, the cost of the insulin is really the largest um, amount of uh, money that's required to support the program. Um, last year in the bill that I, I was carrying, um, I believe that we came up with a number, total number of around $10 million for, per year, but I don't know, we need to go back and, and this language is different, so. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Chair and Senator Wickland. Uh, Senator Jensen, um, do you think your bill will cost $10 million a year? Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Tram. Thank you, Senator Wickland. If we're talking actual dollars, I don't. I think that this bill will be less than that because I think the pharmaceutical manufacturers will be stepping up to the plate and providing probably at least 90% of the cost of this program through insulin product. And to me, what we're trying to do is solve a problem, and that problem has to do with patient care and patients at risk, and to ensure that never again does someone like Alex Smith have to succumb to not having insulin available. Senator Treheim and then Senator Rosen. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this looks very similar to what we passed as a body and signed by the governor in the opioid uh, bill last year, um, an increase on their registration fees for the manufacturers. Uh, it was a very, um, as this is, but very passionate issue that was somewhat driven by the, the, um, the, uh, onerous and uh, abusive behavior by some of the manufacturers and distributors. Uh, it wasn't a bill to penalize, it was a bill to bring all the players to the table and contribute a portion of, a small portion to help those in need that got caught up in the opioid addiction, which is very, very easy to get caught up in, in that um, addictive nature, as we all know, and it's been brought to light. It's a very successful bill to, to date. I think there's, it's a model for other states are looking at it. And we were successful at bringing all the players, manufacturers, distributors, the physicians, the state has a responsibility in it, and everybody had uh, an opinion. They may not have liked the result, but they're living with it, and it's actually it's actually going to work. This, to me, looks like um, a, it's penalizing to the manufacturers. And actually, we are, in, in insulin, it's not about punishing a business that's, that's been profitable. It's about figuring out how we can um, provide a life-saving drug to um, those in need. And the state does have a responsibility in that. And I do th think the manufacturers <coughs> will step up to the plate on this, but I would hate to see another uh, registration fee piled on top of um, a, a, a bill that has been, that was tightly negotiated and crafted and, um, and then have it way down um, the, the, uh, the opioid bill that was so successful last year. Let's keep moving with something that, again, an insulin bill that has been negotiated and worked on for many, many months, and I think we're almost there. Um, and I think uh, Senator Jensen and Senator Pratt and Senator Benson, you've, you've put a lot of time into this too. I think we should allow this to work without any kind of uh, increase in registration fee. So I oppose the amendment. Thank you, Senator Rosen, Senator Abler, Senator Marty, and Senator Franzen. Well, thank you, and I, and I just want to commend the author of the amendment for her tenacity in approaching this, and I actually want to commend the author of the opioid bill for her tenacity in getting that to go, and these are all facing impossible odds against very formidable opponents. And I don't think we would be here if the pricing was done the same as you would have the price of tomatoes or some other commodity, but for no reason I can imagine, the price of insulin has gone up hugely. Uh, to a, in a mode of what I call capitalism gone bad. And 
And so I understand the, the, the desire that many have, and especially if you've lost a child, you think somebody should pay. And uh, sometimes I feel that way too. But I, I, and so if this is $10 million, I'm gonna to speak to that, but I'm gonna to talk to an alternative. I just wanna caution those, should this become law, and who knows what happens by the end of session, if this version becomes law and there's a $10 million impact on the three manufacturers, I wanna remind people that Minnesota is 2% of the country, about, about uh, population-wise. And so this is the first place we're kind of doing this at, in this form. And so being uh, math-oriented, uh, uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturer, the, the insulin manufacturers uh, would realize, boy, it's 10 million here. Across the country, that's a half a billion times 50. But maybe California doubles it, so you have a half a billion to a billion dollar liability that this opens the door up to. I totally believe that it would be in their business interest to do everything they could do to enjoin this and knock it down as some unconstitutional, unfair, or whatever thing. This would be tied up, I think, for years in litigation, and nobody would be helped. And that's my caveat to you who, I don't disagree that they're, it's so wrong what they did with this pricing, uh, which is why my urging is, uh, Senator Rosen, imitation is the highest form of flattery. I just wanna remind you of that. Um, but I think a number that's smaller than 10 million might make sense, perhaps in the range of a half a million per manufacturer uh, in an effort to uh, get some uh, cash in the game from them and then as the state would share some of the costs. Uh, Glenn Taylor uh, suggested in his editorial last summer a shared model of, uh, of savings, of contribution. I do want to um, remind people that I don't see the manufacturers of having come forward much until lately in the effort toward resolution. But I commend them for their work on that. I commend them for their work on opening up assistance programs. Uh, some of those are clunky and don't work the way they think. And so to the boards of directors of those companies, what you think you're doing doesn't hit the streets the way you hope, as many people have testified to. So um, this will be a work in progress. Senator Wicklin, I'm not gonna support this version today, but I think going forward, there might be some room in this in this vein, uh, so. Madam Chair. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just also want to mention that there's other tools in the toolbox that we are currently working on right now. And one of them is the Drug Pricing Transparency Act, <coughs> where we will be able to watch and have some accountability on these price increases on our prescription drugs. And we will know there will be some accountability come from the manufacturers. So uh, this is not the end of the story when it comes to affordable drug pricing. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this is important enough and I'd like to ask for a roll call on it. And the reason I say that is, Senator Rosen, your bill, as you said, I mean, the, the manufacturers of opioids had, I'd argue, a huge role to play in what drove the, their deceptive marketing, their unfair practices. I think that drove the opioid crisis. It killed people. And, so I think it's absolutely necessary that they pay for that. This one, this problem wasn't driven by them. This is caused 100% by them. I talked with some, one di person with diabetes who was telling me that when she started on, on insulin, I'm thinking 25 years ago, she was paying about 20 bucks for what she's now paying 400 bucks for. There's no new innovation in that. That was a product that was on the market at the time. $20, if they were charging 20 bucks for it, we wouldn't have a bill here. We wouldn't have a crisis. We wouldn't have Alex Smith's story to tell. It was 100% caused by the price gouging. And the trouble I have, the reason I think it's important to do something where they're paying for it is the way it is in the bill otherwise is the state of Minnesota and its taxpayers will pay the bill. And if anything, that provides an incentive for the manufacturers to raise prices more. Because the visible stories, the tragedies that happen from people who can't afford the price go away because we're going to pay the cost of it now and they don't have to worry about it, so you can jack up the price further. So I'd argue that without this amendment, we could conceivably be making the problem worse. So I think it's really important that we have it that the people who caused the problem, 100% of the problem, because I, I, really, I really question whether there'd be a single person in the audience here. I don't think there'd be a single bill. I don't think there'd been hearings all summer 
if they were charging 20 bucks instead of 400 bucks. And I, that's, bottom line is we could do this a lot differently than we're doing it, and we wouldn't have to be doing any of it if they were not price gouging. Chair Batson. Thank you, Senator. Um, actually, if you're to that point, otherwise I do have Senator Franzen. I am to that point. Senator Drahan um, to that point. I, I guess my, my question uh, would, would be to uh, the amendment. Um, we're talking about penalizing the manufacturer, but is it the manufacturer? Is it the distributor? Is it the pharmacy? Or is it the insurance company that is the problem? And do we have data to back that up? That, that is my question, I guess, to the author of the amendment and, and to Senator Marty. Senator Wicklund to Senator Dreheim's point, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to address that. I, I think that, yes, you can say that the whole supply chain has a role and in terms of um, the, the prices that are charged, but I think the manufacturers are responsible for setting their prices. And when uh, prices have increased um, over a thousand percent since 1999, um, I don't think that reflects uh, a market where an understanding of patients and their ability to afford the product um, that that's being taken into consideration. And that, that's, that's data. Um, in other countries, uh, patients don't pay what they pay here. They pay much less. Um, many people have heard of the um, diabetic people who are going to Canada to purchase insulin, and it's, you know, $30 for a vial um, there, and they pay, you know, over $300 a vial here for the exact same product. So this isn't um, punitive. This isn't a penalty. This is uh, acknowledgement that, that this problem affects people because of the prices. And if I could allocate that to each part of the supply chain, maybe that would be possible, but um, I don't think that that's straightforward, and I think that the manufacturers do um, have a significant role, and they should contribute um, to the emergency supply um, to the cost that that goes into that. Thank you, Senator Franzen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. Uh, Jensen, um, and to this amendment, thank you, Senator Wickland, for raising it and bringing it forward. Um, I don't like to make any debate personal, but I, I find it pretty um, hard, and, and, and I take it personal that we're, we're comparing um, a bill that was a great move forward for Senator Rosen to this issue. They're they're completely different issue, and I and I, I it just it doesn't it shouldn't be compared to the opioid crisis. It's this is a completely different issue, and it really is disrespectful in my mind to think that um, a mother um, knows that her son was not able to afford a $1,300 um, medicine for their life. It's, like, it, it's price gouging, gouging at, at its best, and, and maybe it's because our system is so out of whack that we haven't had that transparency and, and checks and balances, but that is sort of abusive to have someone pay 1300 when we can also know that we can pay $25. So that just doesn't seem like a good comparison to opioids, um, to this issue of insulin. And it's not about penalizing manufacturer. It's about, you know, this gift to society of science and how this particular um, drug or, or pharmaceutical, in this case, insulin, was a gift to society and to life and to be charging up to and more of that, in some instances, $1,300, is it's a disservice to, to life and to the purpose of what that drug was uh, discovered for. And if we don't do something about it, it is giving, it is giving a free pass on, on, on pr price. God, um, I just, it's, I've had a hard time just listening to the comparison. Um, and, and we're negotiating prices and this amendment, like we're negotiating at an auction or a real estate deal. deal. This is people's lives at stake. And I just find it a little bit um, um, 
hard to, to talk about it, like we can just negotiate what the right price is. We know this was not something that um, anyone wants to put themselves into, and life happens, and sometimes we make less than 50000 sometimes we make more, but it should not cost $1,300 a month or to, to save your life. Uh, so I hope we, we just don't compare it to anything else for the sake of the parents and the families affected. I just don't think um, it's, it's, it's a comparable um, issue. So just wanted to throw that in. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to come back to the focus of this bill right now, though. The whole point of being here is to take care of the needs of insulin-dependent patients. Uh, talking about the method of payment is genuine and valid for us, uh, but we're not minimizing in any way the fact that the whole focus of this bill is to do just that, to take care of those who have these needs. So let's not lose sight of that as we go through a very relevant process, a meaningful process, and denigrate any, in any way, shape, or form that folks' motives come into question here in regards to having a discussion that is valid before us as a legislature. This is a very practical thing, <laughs> working these things out. And even when I looked at the amendment, I had many questions about the language, uh, many issues about fee setting, and then maybe it'll be incorrect, and then we'll correct it the next year. And I go through that and say, this isn't quite so simple as it would, and I think it's valid to have that discussion. In the meantime, the bill we have in front of us, as written without this amendment, does cover the costs and expenses, and we can continue discussing it further as we go along, but it's a valid and practical thing to have that. But I think I have significant questions about this amendment and uh, would rather not deal with this amendment today, but continue having discussion as we go forward to the fiscal note, Finance Committee and other stops we have to do. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, colleagues, uh, for your input. I certainly understand the suspicion and concern regarding whether or not pharma will step up to the plate the way we want them to. I receive one of these every month or so, and this is a, a value program that basically says that, uh, yeah, you can get your insulin for $99 and you can get it for less than that. But if you read the fine print, it says only people without prescription medication insurance can apply for this offer. And what that means is that an awful lot of people are excluded from that. I think what the, the advocates for this bill have done is elevate the discussion and the consciousness. So we're all paying attention. Physicians are paying attention. We're asking our patients more often, are we going to be able to afford this medicine, this insulin? The pharmaceutical companies are hearing the message as well. We all know that um, just by the frequency of their visits to our office. So I think to do something like this today would be premature because we need to find out as we hear stakeholder input and as we start to continue to shape this program, this emergency piece and the ongoing support piece, if we find that 95 to 98 percent of the cost of this program is being borne by the pharmaceutical manufacturers, then the amount of dollars required will be different than if we don't find that. So to Senator Wicklin's amendment, I would oppose it, but I also would like us just to remember that we're looking at something that's limited in scope. This is about helping Minnesotans. We're trying to leverage programs that are already in place and make them better. And we can do that. Personally, I don't like the language in the House bill regarding a floating amount of money that you won't find out about until next year. That reminds me of the country club model, where you don't pay any dues at all until the end of the year. They they add up all the expenses, take away in the revenues, and they say, oh, this is what we're in debt. So they send out a bill to everybody divided by the number of members. If I were running a business, I wouldn't like that model. I'd like to know what I'm going into. I think pharmaceuticals have every right to be a little suspicious of the way some of the, if you will, legisl uh, state uh, agencies have functioned. We have debris for the last three years on how we have misstepped 
whether it's in DHS, whether it's with Minlars, we have over and over again. So if I were, if I were a pharma, I'd be concerned about, well, how are they going to calculate those numbers? I also think that we haven't even established what the pharmaceutical contribution needs to be. And I think when we get the fiscal note, that will help us there. I also am hopeful that the pharmaceutical manufacturers will look at not just insulin, but that they will also turn their attention to EpiPens, to nitroglycerin, to perhaps asthma, uh, rescue drugs. There's, a, there's just a handful of things that are life-sustaining. And I think if we do this bill right, I think we might see pharmaceutical manufacturers taking the initiative in other areas as well, recognizing the distinct difference between ongoing routine medications like Prilosec for your heartburn or Viagra for your erectile dysfunction. This is not the same. We're talking about a life-sustaining medication that, if withdrawn, potentially leads to abrupt deterioration and death. And I think that the pharmaceutical manufacturers are hearing the message loud and clear. So at this point in time, I don't think we should try to legislate price gouging, because if you're going to do that, then we're going to probably have to talk about the fact that in some hospitals in this state, it costs $6,000 to have your appendix removed, but at other hospitals, it's $74,000. And we may need to turn our attention to that as well, if that's what you think the goal of this bill is. Um, members, I'd like to remind you that we want to end committee as close to 4.30 as possible, but allow a significant number of public testimony or a significant time for public testimony. And so if you've heard something be said, um, just acknowledge it and let's move on. Senator Nelson and then Senator Hayden, and then I'd like to go to Senator Wicklund's direction and the roll call that Senator Marty requested on the amendment. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Well, well, just real briefly, um, I'm a little um, perplexed uh, by this amendment because of the unknown quantities uh, that are in it. But I would say I also am wondering, Madam Chair, if I am fully expecting to that every needy Minnesotan who who is under the 400% federal poverty guideline will have free insulin. I believe that's possible, or insulin will be provided for them. I think we can do that. Um, and before I uh, vote on this amendment, which is premature because it doesn't have a, a cost associated with it, it seems to me that uh, we should hear from the testifiers. Um, because I just am curious, thinking there could very well be some light shed on whether or not this type of a government uh, program is necessary if indeed we are going to see uh, insulin um, provided for those under the 400% federal poverty guideline. So my question is, uh, is this an amendment that would be better served and more intelligently voted upon after we hear from the testifiers? Um, Senator Nelson, are you asking Senator Wicklund to withdraw the amendment and wait until after public testimony? Uh, yes, I think, or Senator Wicklund, that would be a, I would love to vote on this after I hear from the folks in the um, audience. Senator Wicklund. Uh, Chair Benson, I am open to that if, as long as we don't run out of time, and I do want us to hear from the public. As well. Senator Wicklund, um, I will make sure that we vote on the A4 before we vote on final passage, if you would like to withdraw it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll withdraw the, the amendment at this time. Then. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. Senator Wicklund withdraws the A4 amendment. Senator Wicklund, do you have any other amendments? Oh, and Senator Hayden, um, are you to the A4 that was withdrawn or to the bill that's before us? Well, I guess just to the bill that's before us. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Without going long, I think that we, we still have some folks that we want to listen to. I, I will just say that I, I, I'm just, a, I don't know, I was thinking about what Senator Francis said. It's this whole idea that, like, you know, like the industry's hearing us now. I'm sure the industry's gonna like lean in now and, and make sure that they kind of take care of it. I, I I just find that just a little troubling. Is it's like you know like the whole reason why we're here is because they weren't listening to us. Is because they were.
price gouging because they weren't providing the service that they could have. That you know, I, I've talked to my friends. I got a friend who's a lobbyist for Lilly, a national lobbyist, and he caught me on you know some one of our healthcare trips and was telling me how they're leaning all the way in now. Well, like you know, like exactly. I mean, you know, Senator Abel was from my ear, like where were you? So. Um, you know, I, I just want to make sure that in the commentary that, you know, I don't have the level of uh, comfort and trust uh, in the pharmaceutical companies and others that they're going to just do the right thing now because of some, it's in front of us. So whatever we choose to do, um, I think that we should do it and we should make that decision and not allow, you know, and not assume that just because we're paying attention now that they're going to come to the table and do the right thing. Um, the other thing is, I have absolutely no frame of reference to your country club analysis. <laughs> Senator Jensen, I just wanted to say, I thought I was picking you up, but since I've never been a member of the country club, I, I, just, I just wanted to just throw that out there. <laughs> Madam Chair, Madam Chair, uh, I don't Senator either, Jensen. Senator Hayden. I just read about it. Thank you. And Senator Wickland? Did you have further amendments you'd like to offer? Would you like me to go to public testimony and then we can return to amendments? Okay, thank you. And members, further amendments from others? Senator Marty. Madam Chair, I was interested in dealing with the sunset and having an amendment for that, but I, I kind of feel we ought to do the testimony if okay. we can be doing that. Okay, so... Um, Members, thank you very much for this conversation. We will return to Senator Marty's amendment and Senator Wickland's A4 amendment. I do have a long uh, testifiers list. Um, let's bring up one on either side of Senator Jensen, Leah Greenside, and Dave Renner from the Minnesota Medical Association. If you could uh, come up to the table. And then Kristen Hotson. Abigail Hansmeyer, if you could be prepared. And we have asked you to keep your comments to two minutes each. I appreciate your patience um, as we've worked through this process. So as you begin, please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Leah Greenside. I'm a small business owner who lives in St. Paul with my husband, my 11-year-old son, and my 13-year-old daughter who has type 1 diabetes. Um, so first, I just want to thank you so much, Senator Jensen, and to so many others who've worked um, really hard on this issue and are committed to, ve to developing a good policy. I really appreciate this conversation. Um, there are three voices in this discussion about what to do about the high cost of insulin. Um, first, like Senator Hayden, you were just describing, the insulin companies are saying that they have voluntarily stepped up to solve the problem, and therefore they shouldn't be assessed a fee. Um, secondly, we have Minnesota's insurance companies highlighting how they have voluntarily stepped up in January and have capped the price of insulin, and therefore they don't need any copay caps put into law. I'm here representing the third voice in this discussion, the voice of Minnesotans, um, like my daughter, who rely on insulin to stay alive and healthy. Um, we are here today telling you that there is still a problem. We are here pleading to you that you, our elected officials, step up to enact the best legislation that we can develop to help us. Um, the voluntary measures by the insulin companies and the insurance companies do not do enough to prevent another Minnesotan from falling through the cracks or having to decide between food on the table and rationing their insulin. So I have three specific recommendations to strengthen the bill to ensure that the greatest number of Minnesotans can access and afford the insulin they need. Um, first, with regard to the copay level for the emergency program, I do feel strongly that $75 is too high. Um, we need to do all that we can to reduce barriers for people who are facing emergencies, and I'd like to see that lowered to $30 um, or lower to ensure that that happens. Um, second, with regard to the funding of the program, um, there's a, we have an opportunity here to structure funding to encourage the insulin companies to continue their voluntary efforts to ensure that everyone can access and afford their product. Insulin companies, not the state of Minnesota, should be responsible for picking up the tab if someone falls through the cracks and can't access or afford their product. So I would request that you change the funding of the emergency insulin program so that insulin companies have a financial incentive to prevent insulin emergencies. 
And then third, I request that language be added to this bill capping insulin co-payments for Minnesota insurers um, at a maximum of $30 for plans regulated by the state. Um, and just importantly, this copay cap must include all available insulin types, not just those on the plan's formulary. So my family has individual insurance that we purchased through Minsure. I was very excited when I thought we'd be paying $25 for our insulin come January. That is not the case for us um, because my daughter's insulin is not on the formulary. So to conclude, I'm grateful to all of you for your efforts to help, help families like mine. Um, I think we have a great opportunity here to craft legislation that can serve as a national model um, and provide the needed safety net that we need for Minnesotans until the hard and necessary work of reducing drug prices can be accomplished. So thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Renner. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, Dave Renner with the Minnesota Medical Association. Uh, I will also try to be brief because I think a lot of our concerns have been addressed in the A8 amendment. Um, and I want to thank Senator Jensen, Senator Benson, Senator Wickley, and all of you who have been working on this for, for, for many months. Um, physicians, like a lot of you, are having a hard time understanding why insulin prices have gone up as much as they have. So uh, we really appreciate the work that you're doing here. I think with, under the AA amendment, uh, the new distribution system makes sense not only, of course, as a removal of a new burden for, for clinics and practitioners, but it also helps for patients because patients, um, historic, that's where patients get their drugs. And as was stated by, I think, uh, earlier, many diabetics are also have other comorbidities and it makes much more sense to be able to get the, their, their insulin at the same place they pick up their other medications. Um, so uh, we really appreciate that. And I, I do need to also just make a comment that while this is critical that we address this issue of insulin, uh, this is just an issue I think Senator Jensen made reference to. There are many life-saving drugs that are becoming more and more affordable. So I really appreciate the work that many of you have done uh, on Senator Rosen's bill and others to address the overall drug pricing. And, uh, and address that uh, in a much bigger uh, global uh, message. So with that, I appreciate it, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Next, uh, Kristen Hotson, Abigail Hansmeyer, and then if Nathan Lowy and Annette Gentile could please uh, be prepared. And please, if I mispronounce your names, <laughs> state them for the record correctly, and I'll do my best to uh, annotate. Um, Ms. Hotson? Yeah, hi, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Kristen Hotson, and my 12-year-old son, uh, this is him, uh, he has type 1 diabetes. And I want to thank all of you, and especially the Insulin Working Group, uh, for the time that you have invested into this issue. Uh, before I uh, go on, I want to continue by, I, I want to start by celebrating the progress that has been made this year. Uh, insurers in Minnesota now have to pass the savings they receive from manufacturer insulin rebates onto their customers. Minsure and other plans are, some other plans are offering $25 or less copays on insulin. And insulin manufacturers are offering more discounts in response to public pressure. Uh, that said, uh, the need for an insulin assistant program is still critical. Not all Minnesotans needing insulin will benefit from these recent measures. And for those of us who do, these supports are tenuous. Uh, here are four reasons why. Uh, number one, the state mandate on insulin uh, that passes manufacturer rebates onto consumers only helps those who A, have insurance, and B, use formulary insulins. Uh, diabetics without insurance or those like my son uh, who have significantly better results with a non-formulary insulin uh, don't benefit from this. Number two, uh, insulin copay caps only apply to a limited number of health care plans, and the jury's still out on to whether there will be lasting uh, support of this program for Minnesotans who need insulin. Uh, Minsure's copay caps on insulin have only been in effect for six weeks, and I've already heard uh, concerns about whether this will be sustainable. Uh, and uh, also with copay caps, they also only apply to formulary insulins. Third, uh, manufacturer uh, discounts are great and helpful, and I hope they continue, but I'm not confident of this. Uh, as an example, uh, the back of my 
current discount card from an insulin manufacturer states, the parties reserve the right to rescind, revoke, or amend this offer without notice at any time. Let me read that again. They reserve the right to rescind, revoke, or amend this offer without notice at any time. So there's a lot of pressure on insulin manufacturers right now, and it makes me wonder what will happen when this issue isn't in the spotlight. Number four, the 340B uh, program and community health centers um, are a great resource for some, but they will not work for all diabetics. They offer huge discounts uh, for insulin, but only if a doctor there will prescribe it. In December, I got a phone call while driving my son to an appointment at a community health center for insulin. The doctor called to tell me she wouldn't prescribe uh, insulin for my son if we came, and maybe I don't wanna bother coming. And the reason for that was that they refer children who have type one diabetes to pediatric endocrinologists for care. And I get this, they want the best care uh, for my child. Um, but this means that patients like my son who need to be referred to an endocrinologist won't be able to get the 340B pricing. So in summary, these are some of the reasons that an insulin assistance program is still needed. It'll save lives and provide hope to families dealing with this awful disease, knowing that their lives won't be at risk if the unexpected happens. The price of a month's worth of emergency insulin is tiny compared to the alternatives, hospitalization, complications, and even death. In light of all this, I urge you to pass this bill and continue to work with the House for a compromise. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Lowy, I'm sorry, Nathan Lowy, Abigail Hansmeyer, I apologize. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, um, I wanna thank you greatly for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I know that two minutes doesn't really give me enough time to convey everything, so I'll jump right into it. But I do want to thank um, Senator Wickland for your amendments today. Um, that kind of shifts my testimony a little bit because, um, well, I'll just, I'll just start. <laughs> um, my name is Abigail Hansmeyer. I have been living with type 1 diabetes for 24 years. I attended the Commerce Committee hearing on Tuesday, and there were questions about compromise. Um, uh, how was the House bill, how have we compromised with the Senate Republicans on this bill? Uh, the first thing I would point is to the federal poverty level for eligibility. Eligibility to ensure we include those most at risk was initially 600% within the House bill. Um, I'd like to point out that proposals from Senate continues to firmly stay at that 400% of the poverty, federal poverty level, um, and that doesn't reach far enough. Um, so we're hoping to kind of meet that 500% as a compromise. Uh, the second part of this bill that is concerning for me is the emergency portion. I feel there are many barriers that have put in place before eligibility is even a possibility. After those obstacles, patients are being charged $75 at the pharmacy on top of the additional 25 to physicians um, to act as a dispensary. I realize now that with the A9 amendment, it would eliminate that $25 fee, but that still puts us at that $75 cost to access the emergency supply. Um, I see also that um, for eligibility, if a patient has insulin available to them for less than $100, they do not qualify for this emergency access. So who other, just recently, than the three insulin manufacturers um, have offered a program for $99? Therefore, if we cannot access the emergency supply, um, Sorry, if we cannot, um, if the if we are deferring to, um, sorry, <laughs> I lost my sp my spot. Um, if we have these pharmaceutical programs in place, where you can access a supply of insulin for ninety nine dollars, and this bill is saying that if you have access to insulin less than a hundred dollars, this bill essentially is deferring people back to these pharmaceutical programs that we know are not working for diabetics. Um, so that was a main issue that I saw with that $100 um, eligibility piece. Um, you know, and then even further, we always hear about the debate about Walmart insulin and how that's available to people for $25. 
that is also insulin that is less than $100? Are we then going to be deferred back to Walmart insulin? I hope not. <laughs> uh, the last piece, and I know we've been talking about the funding. I know that we need to kind of move this forward and talk more specifically, get more data to kind of land on an appropriate fiscal note for this bill. Um, but I will echo many who have said that I believe the pharmaceutical companies need to participate in part. You know, everyone needs to come to the table. Um, last thing is just, um, Madam Chair and committee members, I hope that if as advocates we have not done enough to inform you of the necessary information you are needing for this bill to offer resolve to this crisis, that you would communicate that. I would hope that you would offer a seat at the table for advocates to help this bill be what it needs to be for nearly half a million Minnesotans. We're close, but we're not there. We are fighting for our lives every day. If you've ever had a crisis outside of your control be forced upon you and had to fight this hard for your life, constantly knocking down barriers placed before you time and time again, I hope with every fiber of my being that your efforts did not fall on deaf ears. Certainly, I don't wish that for you or anyone, especially when we have a solution in front of us that simply asks for compromise. I thank you again, Madam Chair, and all the members of this committee. I look forward to seeing this bill progress and hoping that we can build one that works for Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansmeyer. Um, Mr. Lowy, Ms. Gentile, or Gentile, and then uh, please be prepared Malia Kamara and Maria Isa Perez. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Nathan Lowy, and I have been a type 1 diabetic for 30 years, and I'm father to Jet, who was diagnosed three years ago. My family and I, along with countless diabetics across the state, would like to commend the Senate for moving forward with a bill proposal, as we are in a critical time with diabetics continuing to ration their insulin on an almost daily basis based on the number of social media posts that I've seen since January 1st. There are many areas that have been compromised on, but there are still some that are concerning to those of us who live with, di who live with this disease 24-7, 365. Speaking of 24-7, 365, or all the time, is something that diabetics don't have in an emergency. Four sources of ongoing coverage are listed ahead of an emergency fill and all take time to either apply for, enroll in, or schedule appointments with. Um, another area that I was going to address, which I am grateful to Senator Jensen's amendment to uh, the bill already, was the uh, source of the insulin having to go to your practitioner. Um, my, I, I am very grateful that that amendment went through and passed, but one question I would have is the supply of insulin going through the pharmacy, is it something that I would be able to go to the pharmacy same day and pick up, or would the manufacturer still have to send it to the pharmacy and my having to wait for myself or my child to go pick it up until that insulin was delivered. Uh, so that would be something I would definitely urge discussion on and changing wording on so we can uh, find out what the true outcome is going to be. Um, another area that I see as completely uncompromisable is the sunset. Uh, diabetes is a lifelong disease. I was diagnosed with it 30 years ago, and I will have it until the day that I die. Uh, it does not go away. With a sunset, with a proposed sunset in this bill, anyone who was born on or after January 1, 1998, would never see the benefit of this bill. My child, who is nine, will not have a safety net if this is not amended. Instead, I would suggest a review process instead of a definitive sunset, and that would be something that would be beneficial. Review the bill after so many years, instead of hard stop at the end of 2023. Um, I do have a few comments that were in relation to a couple of the amendments, and I'm sorry I did not take down the numbers of which amendment was which, but I believe it was A2 was uh, Senator Benson, you had referenced the uh, cap in Colorado at $100. That was not a emergency supply cap, that was a copay cap. Um, so I would definitely like that to be noted that the the amount of the one hundred dollars that Colorado passed was for a copay cap and not in the uh, not an amount for an emergency refill or emergency supply of insulin. Um, another 
number that was stated was the $10 million and us being 2% of the country um, and how much that would end up being half a billion dollars for manufacturers. Um, yes, while that number is true, we're talking about three manufacturers. So it would be about $167, or $167 million per manufacturer instead of half a, half a billion per manufacturer. Still a large number, but something that I feel should be clarified. Um, and then lastly, in the funding aspect of the bill, um, why are we discussing, and this is a rhetorical question, but why are we discussing a hard stop on $10 million or a million dollars? If I'm the patient that goes through needing an emergency supply and I'm at that $10 million threshold and then next week my son needs an emergency supply, is his life not as valuable as everybody who is up to that point of the $10 million? Another thing that I would definitely suggest a uh, discussion on. Um, in closing, I'm extremely appreciative for the progress that has been made by the working group and by the Senate, and I would ask that advocates are included in the progression of this bill as this values Minnesotans' lives, and I want to ensure, and we as diabetics want to ensure that this values Minnesotans over manufacturers. Thank you. Ms. Gentile. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Annette Gentile, and I have had type 1 diabetes for 32 years. I am grateful for the progress that has gotten us to this point in which voices of diabetics are being heard, and that we have many areas of agreement between the House and the Senate on a dire need for emergency access. However, I still have some concerns. These involve portions of the eligibility eligibility. Applicants are ineligible if they have access to insulin less than $100 per month. All three manufacturer programs have insulin available for 99 per limited supply per month. Well, 99 for each insulin is better than the, my current cost of $900 my, monthly. It is still more than I can afford with my $1,200 monthly disability checks. Not to mention the amount Amounts available for $99 is not enough to last me a full month. Secondly, sending all applicants information to the manufacturers to check eligibility for assistance or coupon programs takes time. And that is not something diabetics have in an emergency. I have about six hours before I go into DKA and would have to be hospitalized. Additionally, in subdivision six, there's a portion that lists having discussions about alternatives to prescribed insulin that is too costly for the consumer. That includes lower cost or generic insulin. Lower cost insulin is the human insulin or otherwise known as the Walmart insulin, which is not a viable option. I strongly encourage and am hopeful that a compromise can be made between the House and the Senate that is considering the needs of all diabetic Minnesotans over the manufacturers. And I hope that insulin advocates are communicated with as amendments are made to this bill. Thank you so much. And thank you for your timeliness. I appreciate thank your you. conciseness. Um, Ms. Kamara and Ms. Perez, and then, Follow them with Sharon Lamberton and Sarah Deer. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Hi, my, uh, thank you for having me, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Maria Isa Perez Hedges. I am an artist here in the great state of Minnesota, as well as a mother and a type one diabetic for over 16 years. I'm here in solidarity with Minnesota's Insulin for All group. Uh, we're grateful to see this here in this legisl legislative session. However, we can't wait any longer. My life is dependent on two forms of insulin daily. I'm grateful to have access to coverage right now, but that fluctuates as we grow. As a small business owner of a record label that produces music here out of Minnesota, um, it's challenging. And I'm here to fight for not just myself and everyone here, but for my daughter, because even though she wasn't born with type 1 diabetes, her chances of getting diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is much larger than anyone else's. Um, I've seen and have survived. Let's not say seen, because I'm losing eyesight if I don't have the insulin that I need. 
We talk about insulin and being dependent, but this triggers heart disease, this triggers eye disease, kidney failure. There's a list of other things. Thank you, Senator Franson, for making a point that this is not to be compared with the opiates mm -hmm. crisis. This is something that we are dependable to be able to breathe just like oxygen is for everyone sitting in this room. I have survived being the college student who is off of mom and dad's insurance and has had to rush to emergency so that I can get a vial of insulin to be able to be alive and not fall into a diabetic coma. I have survived that. I have survived recognizing that things can change. I hope though that this change is that we all don't have to hear about another death like Alex Smith and the two other Minnesotans that have passed after him. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Perez. And uh, Malia Kamara, please proceed. Madam Chair, my name is Malia Kamara. I am 17 years old and I am a senior in high school. I was diagnosed at four years old. So I'm one of those that is not included in what Nathan said. I was born in 2002. So therefore with this bill, I will not have a safety net. So I'm gonna give you a scenario just to express how, what it will be like. So when I'm in college, and I wanna, be, I wanna go to college to be a diabetic educator, um, I just made a college payment and I look at how much insulin I have. I'm not sure if I'm gonna make it until my next paycheck. Um, I have to sit there and think, what's gonna happen when I use the rest of my insulin? What's, what's gonna happen if I have to start rationing it? I will die in a matter of hours without my insulin. Yes, there are other programs that are out there, but what if I don't have the $99? What if I can't wait the one to three days to be able to get it? I need to have access to an emergency insulin right away so I can feel safe. I do not wanna die because I had to choose if I pay for my college or if I pay for my insulin. I have things that I wanna be able to check off my bucket list. I wanna have a future, I wanna have kids, I wanna have family. I have a lot of things that I wanna do. I wanna be able to give back to everybody. And I know that I have the potential to be great and do great things but the fear of death is in my way. What's gonna happen when I can't pursue my hopes and dreams because I didn't have access to emergency insulin? Um, I just wanna say that I'm glad that it's going through. And um, I have been in DKA once, and I will say now that that was one of the scariest experiences of my life, and I don't wanna go through that again. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Sharon Lamberton and Sarah Dirk. Senator. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Benson and members of the committee. My name is Sharon Lamberton. I'm with the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, trade association of more than 38 member companies, three of which are insulin manufacturers. In addition to working at Pharma, I'm also a registered nurse, and diabetes is near and dear to my heart. My mom's had diabetes forever. 30 years and I've watched her lose her eyesight, have kidney issues and cardiovascular disease. And I do believe no one with diabetes should live without their medicines. And we make incredible medicines. We have 170, 180 new medicines in the pipeline for diabetes, but all of that does no good if our patients can't access it. Patients should not worry about affording insulin and it doesn't matter if we are making these great innovations, but our companies have stepped up. We have pharmaceutical patient assistance programs that reach a great number of patients and could reach more. In addition to the PAP programs, we have medication assistance tools, which is a program of 900 public and private programs that are a repository, one-stop shopping, that bring all those programs together so a nurse, a, a daughter, a patient can find those programs and get help with that. Also, we have coupons available as well. Insurance, though, is clearly not working like it should. Patients' costs are going up and why? Discounts are not being shared with the patient at the point of sale at the pharmacy counter. After discounts, net prices for insulin is actually reduced by 70% or more. Long-term long insulin costs are less today than in 2000, but this bill respectfully does not address the insurance designs issues that are, exist. It ab absolutely duplicates a lot of the patient assistance programs that we have. It ignores the fact that a lot of insurers set the price for what the patient pays. 
Um, we also have serious constitutional concerns, taking concerns with, with this bill. There are solutions I would like to bring to the committee. They are four. One of them is having the savings passed down to the patient at the point of sale, making sure those rebates that we pay um, over $527 million here in the state of Minnesota going to the patient. Number two, plan designs need to change. A lot of plans have made changes here in Minnesota to zero to $25 copays. I'd like to see all plans offer health plan options with fixed dollar prescription drug copays or no prescription drug coinsurance or, or deductible. And third, the disease management programs that are out there could be better utilized. If patients used their medicines as prescribed and nurses and providers help them do so, you could save up to $409 a month for a beneficiary, or you could save $20 million here in the state of Minnesota, a recent study I'd love to share. But all these policies, they could have immediate impact um, while not duplicating programs that already exist. In closing, we appreciate the hard work of this committee and the sponsors, and we look forward to continuing working together, but we do believe that this legislation does not address the key issues as to why patients have high out-of-pocket costs. Thank you for your time. Ms. Durr. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Durr, and I am a pharmacist and the executive director of the Minnesota Pharmacists Association. We represent pharmacists and pharmacies across the state of Minnesota. Thank you for inviting us today. We appreciate that you and many of your colleagues are trying to address this problem for our patients, and we hope that we can come to an agreement that will work for all patients, providers, and pharmacies. I do appreciate Senator Jensen introducing the, the information about having this done at the pharmacy, because um, over 90% of pharm or patients in Minnesota diagnosed with diabetes and those who have been prescribed insulin by their physician are filling this at the community pharmacy. Many of our community pharmacies are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and many are also open till 10 p.m. if they are not 24 hours a day. Pharmacies provide incredible access to Minnesotans, and pharmacists are the number one healthcare provider that a patient sees on a regular basis during the year. We believe that any legislative solution should build on existing patient assistance infrastructure to the greatest extent possible. The supply chain infrastructure should continue with manufacturers, developing and making insulin products, physicians and healthcare providers, diagnosing and prescribing insulin, and pharmacists and pharmacies, counseling patients, filling prescriptions, and being a resource for both the patient and the provider. If you do have any questions in the future, feel free to reach out to me, but thank you very much for your work on this. Thank you. Um, members, now we're back to um, the business at the table. Amendments, questions, and comments would be appropriate. And uh, Senator Wickland, because we because you withdrew the A4, I'm going to defer to you as to how you'd like to proceed next. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would like to re-offer the, the A4, or at offer, not re-offer. I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Wicklin offers the A4 <clears throat> amendment. Senator Marty, you had requested a roll call. Senator Marty requests a roll call. Senator Abler to the A4. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know if she's prepared to comment on it, but Ms. Lamberton was down here. She talked about taking. So I was curious if she had an opinion about this amendment that I'd be interested in hearing. Ms. Lamberton, Senator Abler would like to know your opinion on the A4. Sorry, I didn't mean to be so far away. <laughs> Senator Ms. Benson. Benson. To the A4? Yes. Um, the question was, do we have an opinion on the A4? We just received these amendments shortly before the hearing, so I would need more time, but I do look forward to working with the committee on this amendment. At this moment, our concerns, as I've laid out in our statement and my testimony, still stand. Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Abler. And so, and I, I understand, and I know you have to parse all your words carefully, and I knew that when I asked you to come down, but um, I think at some point there's a number that won't be a taking that's a reasonable accommodation to the needs of Minnesota that your groups could find reasonable. I expressed in my concerns earlier that 10 million might not be reasonable, um, but I think uh, Mr. Taylor, who's a smart business guy, uh, wrote an editorial, talked about shared, and I think it's time for you all to get your crew and, and start sharing. The, um, if only for the PR value, because I mean, you're trying, you all mean well, but some of these proposals that helping people aren't 
working as much as you think, and it's just got to be a hard thing to, to be in your position with the government relations and all. But I, I, I do believe that your group and the manufacturers have some good intent that I'm really hoping can come forward as we find a number that makes sense. I believe the, the, number, the answer going forward is some version of a fee that at some point will not be construed as a taking. And states have the right to regulate who does business and how we uh, do our work. So that's just my thought. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Thank you. And Senator Wicklin, to your amendment. Um, I think I, I would just reiterate that I, I believe that um, introducing this now into the bill would allow us to have more discussion about um, what the fee should be going forward. This doesn't have an exact figure. We need to have more information um, from the fiscal note. Um, but I do think it's important that we um, move forward with the concept of a shared responsibility for the emergency um, insulin and that is what I see this amendment doing so I still I would hope that I have your support for it but um, I, I want to move forward with the vote. Thank you members. Um, Senator Wicklin renews her motion on the A4 amendment. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Madam Chair. Senator Jensen. Prior to voting, could I just make one comment? Yeah. Senator Again, Jensen. Madam Chair, thank you, and, and Senator Wicklund, thank you. I agree with you completely, Senator Wicklund, that we need to have this discussion and it needs to be continuing. But as I mentioned before, the idea of a floating billing process that takes place after a year has been completed just seems to me so challenging and we have had so many challenges already in the last 18 months that you know if we land on something where we say that we need a safety net assessment to get some seed money and we need to do something like that but because we don't have a fiscal note i'm just uncomfortable with this notion of a floating bill by the way uh pharmaceutical companies we won't tell you what you're going to get billed uh uh, until next year, and that'll be for this year. I just, I think that it's premature, so I would speak against it. Senator Rosen. Yes, the, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Jensen, for speaking up to this. It's, um, I understand the concept of shared sacrifice, and this is truly a case, but this is an amendment that has not been vetted through uh, correctly. Um, no one knows exactly what the manufacturers are paying at this point, what, what the manufacturing fee is until I actually just looked it up. Uh, there has to be conversations around the table because there is a pressure point in this business. There is a pressure point where we do not want to create something uh, damaging to, to uh, the users of insulin, perhaps. There's, there's a lot that goes into creating a registration fee increase and making sure that the market stays stable on it. So uh, perhaps it's a good idea. I think it's, I, I will be voting no on this. I think it has a lot more um, uh, work that needs to be done because the conversations have not been, they're not mature enough to vote yes on something like this. We're not ready. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my comments are, are quite similar. Uh, Senator Wicklin, you have worked on this so hard, and I am so glad, and I have been pleased to support uh, your efforts and the efforts of all uh, to make sure that Minnesotans do not have to ration this life-saving drug. It truly is a matter. Uh, it is to that degree. But I do have some un uh, discomfort with the language that is here right now um, in your A4 amendment. But I want to be very clear. I do expect, I think we all expect, the pharmaceutical companies to pay a portion of this. In fact, I think, you know, they should pay for uh, the insulin for everyone who's under 400%. Um, that'd be the best thing for uh, Minnesotans who are uh, in need of insulin is if it was the, pharmace the, the um, pharmaceuticals doing that. Um, we all know that government programs are 
we're not known for having programs that are easy to administer or for people to access. Um, so while I uh, am in line with your thought as far as um, shared responsibility and shared participation, uh, I, I'm, I'm just not sure that this amendment today is uh, is not one that is going to get my support today. I do want to see the pharmaceuticals step up. I do want to see them uh, pay for that life-saving insulin. And if they don't, I will be back supporting your amendment, but not today. Senator Wicklin renews her motion on the A4 amendment. A roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. The clerk will call the roll. Senator Benson. No. Senator Jensen. No. Senator Marty. Yes. Senator Abler. No. Senator Draheim. No. Senator Eaton. Yes. Senator Franzen. Yes. Senator Hayden. Senator Kipmeyer. No. Senator Klein. Senator Matthews. No. Senator Nelson. No. Senator Rosen. No. Senator Wickland. Yes. Senator Hayden. There being five yes votes and eight no votes, the motion does not prevail and the uh, A4 amendment is not adopted. Senator Marty, I believe you had an amendment. Madam Chair, I have the A1 amendment. Senator Marty moves the A1 amendment as it's being distributed. Would you like to begin your description? Sure, Madam Chair, this is a simple one to describe. It simply deletes the sunset and I'm Thinking on the name of the witness, a few minutes ago, um, uh, Mr. Lowy talked about how diabetes doesn't have a sunset and he has it for the rest of his life. Um, I'm not saying that this program will be needed forever. If we can get fair prices on pharmaceuticals, we won't need it, but I would argue we should not be sunsetting this before it even takes effect. We always do look at programs like this. We should look at them after a few years, um, but I don't think before we even get the thing in place, we need a sunset. So I move the A1 amendment. Senator Marty moves the A1 amendment. Discussion, members? Senator Jensen? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Marty. Uh, perhaps a couple of prefacing remarks. Senator Marty, I have enjoyed working with you immensely throughout the years, but on this point, I could not more sharply disagree with you than I do. To me, a sunset needs to be put in place at the beginning because if we don't then, we never will. And this is why we have some of these remarkable situations facing us today where the public has lost a lot of confidence in the way we review procedures, review programs. If we don't put a sunset in place, quite frankly, yeah, we might review it, but we might not. We had an outcome with a 2% a provider tax moving to a 1.8%. But I'll tell you, we had one heck of a discussion. And I think everybody down here learned, and while people maybe didn't walk away feeling like they won, I just think that a sunset is something that we should get in the habit of putting in virtually every program. And I think you do it at the front end, not the back end. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, just a real quick response. I carried a program a number of years ago that that didn't have a sunset into it. And a few years later, the technology has changed. We didn't need it anymore. And I carried the bill to repeal it. And I think that's the way we ought to do it. If we want a sunset, it should be a little more a few years further down the road than this one. Madam Chair. Senator Jensen. Senator Marty, I am older than you. And I don't think I have the luxury of staying around as long as you have in order to deal with that in this bill. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well. I think when um, we found a cure for diabetes and the disease ends, that would be the time that I would accept a sunset in this bill. Senator Abler. 
Well, just in brief, and I, this bill has come so far uh, in the process, and I don't know if this is exactly the right sunset, and maybe there's, we need to work on having a different parts, but I, um, I'm going to vote no on the amendment for now, but the, the reason you'd like, just to help people understand, the sunset doesn't mean it goes away. It means you sharpen it and you make it better. I don't think if, when this becomes enacted, the emergency program is never going away, just to can help people that are concerned. Uh, but as, the as we've seen the pharmaceutical manufacturers improve their programs, we want to make sure it's pointed and focused. So that's all I got. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, Senator Marty. Senator Marty renews his motion on the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? No. no. The amendment is not adopted. Thank you, Senator Marty. Members, further amendments? Okay, members, uh, Senate File 3019, as amended, is before us. Do we have closing comments? And Senator Wicklin? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just be brief. I know we're, people are, need to get going, uh, but I, I just wanted to say I, I am pleased that we are having this discussion and that we have the potential for having future discussions and future opportunities to review the bill and other committees. Um, I will definitely be thinking about ways that we can make the bill stronger. One area we didn't really, um, we discussed um, the A9 amendment, addressed some of the technical concerns of Minsure, but I think we really do need to have a, another review with, um, with Minsure and other government um, agencies that should be involved uh, to make sure that the language is workable for them. So I hope that you're committed, Senator Jensen, to working with them on that because I think that's an important part of making the bill successful. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Wickland. I would actually ask Senator Benson to comment on this because uh, her breadth of knowledge in regards to Minsure is extensive. And I, I agree with you. We need to have that discussion again. But my understanding is in passing the A9, we have allowed Minsure to see with more definition what they're dealing with, and that may well give us a better fiscal note. Senator Benson, would you please comment on it from your perspective? Um, it, Senator Jensen, our... Uh, we have tried to engage Minsure. They've done a really good job of giving us feedback, but the goal is to have a single filter for the benefit of Minnesotans who depend on insulin so that we have a large number of resources visible in one place, but it has to be interoperable with Minsure. And so um, to the extent that we can modify this bill to make interoperability more workable, more affordable, more stable, so that we don't have Sunday afternoon um, Minsure failures. Um, that will be part of the mission going forward. And um, the, the benefit of having a second look at this with the fiscal notice, I think we'll see significant development over that timeline. A final comment on that, Madam Chair? Senator thank, Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's important for everybody that's following this issue to realize that this insulin working group that's been going on for the last six months has worked immensely hard, and that's been uh, led in part by uh, Senator Pratt. And uh, But I also think that I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to uh, Ms. K Katie Kavanagh and uh, Mr. Dennis Albright for helping us so much, because a lot of these details, these things that make this program work or not, these operational grinding out, th th thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, uh, uh, Ms. Kavanaugh turned out nine amendments uh, in the last 18 hours, uh, and I uh, just really appreciate it. And I know Senator Wickland does as well, so thank you. Comments from other members? Okay. Um, I'm going to make just a, a brief uh, comment. Um, first of all, Senator Jensen, thank you for... Um, stepping into a place where we can start to rebuild some trust. Um, Senator Pratt worked very, very hard, and it is disappointing that he is not going to get to carry this across the finish line. That being said, I'd like to speak um, to the, the people in the pharmaceutical industry who aren't in this room. And so maybe you want to video clip this and take it back to the people who make their primary goal in life meeting quarterly numbers. We know you need to take care of shareholders and investors. You need to pay your debts. You need to keep doing research. You need to keep improving people's lives. But what I have seen in the last several months, the effort that has been put forward by the people who keep coming with ideas and coming with ideas and coming with ideas, 
and then somebody above them is saying, yeah, I can't really go any further. The people above need to see this. The people who make it their primary goal to meet quarterly sales numbers by setting prices need to see this. That's one. Number two, um, the federal rebate game and the way we do pricing makes absolutely no sense. The Trump administration is putting forward an option for a second pathway. I need the pharmaceutical industry to think long and hard about how you can relieve pressure at this point in particular, but prescription drugs in general, by looking at that alternative pathways. I can help you with enabling legislation. I would love to cheerlead an alternative to the high price rebating model that we currently have. But you gotta want it. And days like today should make you want it. You have to want to give relief to your patients. The idea that rebates should be passed down to people at the point of sale. How about just have a normal price at the point of sale? So. Um, the bill will continue to move. There will continue to be work on it. I am glad it is public and uh, we're going to do what we do, adjusting it to make it better. And I thank you, Senator Jensen, if you could go to closing comments, then move the bill as amended to commerce. I would close by simply saying thank you for your closing comments. With that, members, Senator Jensen moves that Senate file 3019 as amended be recommended to pass to the Committee on Commerce. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? <laughs> Senate file 3019 as amended is on its way. Thank you, members. And with that, we are adjourned.